Yes, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And uh, thanks to Larry that he invited me again to speak in front of the CSO audience. It was the first time in 2004 that Larry invited me uh, to speak at a conference. I think it, I, it was the 72nd uh, in Niagara Falls, the 72nd CSO conference in Niagara Falls. And for me, it was the first time that I um, flew over the ocean, the first time in North America. And it was quite an adv adventure. Uh, same applies to my recent flight. Uh, I even traumatized my Achilles tendon a little bit when I tried to reach my connection flight tonight. And I also had probably three hours of sleep. And since uh, English is not my, uh, I'm not a native speaker, um, I hope that you can forgive me if it's not perfect, because my brain is somewhere paced in another um, frequency, so to say. But anyway, I'll try to do my best. And um, could you just give me your hand if you already um, participated in one of my previous presentations? So I oh, almost half the, the audience. So at least for all the others, it might be something completely new. And um, when Larry asked me to give the presentation, I asked him, what would you like to hear from me? Which topic is of interest for the group, for you guys? And I said, you can talk about anything you want. So this was the most difficult answer to me. <laughs> because this makes it even harder um, to bring together all the different aspects I want to transmit in this, in this talk. And then he also said we had something about uh, blue light hazard last year. Don't know if the audience will be interested, but I'm, in a way I insist to give you some information on that, some pieces of information on that. And so I think we are ready to start. Complementary spectra in phototherapy, basic principles and practical applications. And I would like to make a journey, a time shift back to where it all started and how it started to the beginning of the 19th century. I would say this was the dawn of photobiology these days. It all started with the discoveries of Herschel and Ritter. They explored the ends of the spectrum and discovered the invisible part of the spectrum. They discovered infrared and ultraviolet, respectively. You can see on the one side here we have a, 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 a photo graphic apparatus, a camera, and this was necessary to display the short wavelengths. And on the other side you see a thermometer, and this is what Friedrich Wilhelm, later William Herschel, did in 1800, so right with the, in the beginning of the 19th century. He, he was an astronomer, and he discovered the infrared radiation by shining a spectrum or projecting a spectrum onto different uh, thermopiles or thermometers and discovered beyond the red there is even a higher temperature rise on his reading instruments. And um, he published this and for some of the researchers these days in a way they applied this principle to the Petri dish. They were interested in the influence of light on plants, the um, photosynthesis, because um, light would activate plants to growth, so it was evident that plants cannot live without light. 
and without the, the energy of light. And um, this was the first step in photobiology, but then they projected the colors of the rainbow spectrum onto the Petri dish in order to find out if there were any preferences of bacteria on this Petri dish, if these bacteria would have some color preferences. And indeed, they found that some of the bacteria had a preference for red, some of them had preference for yellow, but um, none of them would have a preference for the shorter wavelengths, for the violet, for example, or the indigo, or for the blue. And later on, which has been discovered by Downs and Blunt, these two um, physicians from Britain, they found out that it's even more than a kind of negative phototaxis, which means bacteria would escape if you let them go wherever they want to. But if you have them in a quartz glass tube, and if you shine the violet light and even more the ultraviolet light onto them, they would just die. So they found out that there is a way to eradicate, to kill germs via light. And this was really an important step um, by these two um, researchers from Great Britain, Sir Arthur Henry Downs and Thomas Porter Blunt. And this fueled Finsen's idea, Niels Rüberg Finsen, the first physician who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1903. But in, still in the late 19th century, Finsen was interested in light. He came from Denmark and in the Baltic region there is a kind of lack of light, lack of natural light, especially during the winter. And so he, was, he became especially interested in the effects of light. And uh, this um, was one of his um, major achievements, that he, he experimented in a scientific manner with light, coming from observation of animals, of cats, for example. But he also found out that, for example, earthworms would behave differently if they are kept under red light or under violet light. And the first uh, major achievement of Finsen was a kind of negative light therapy by bringing mm, patients with smallpox into red rooms. And you might read in some of the textbooks that this was a kind of um, first um, case of emerging chromotherapy mm, by treating the smallpox with red light. But in fact, if we look a little bit closer into this issue, it's not 100% correct and it's not 100% true because it was a negative um, chromotherapy or light therapy. What does this mean? He just took out some of the spectral regions which would cause an inflammation in the patients who suffered from smallpox. And he brought them into rooms with red walls, with red curtains, so that no unfiltered daylight could access these um, hospital rooms. And what would you think? Which part of the spectrum was filtered out by using red light, red curtains, red walls? Of course, the long wavelength part the blue, the indigo, the violet, and even more, the ultraviolet. And this is what we still know from chickenpox today. If you bring children with chickenpox into daylight, they will suffer from an increase in inflammation of their lesions. So this is the reason why we keep still in medicine children suffering from chickenpox in dark rooms. Red rooms would be better because it's kind of depressing if you are hampered in vision by being for two weeks or so in a darkened room. So the red rooms were much better. And this saved thousands of lives because we are talking about the late 19th century with a complete lack of antibiotics, 
So they had to prevent inflammation and especially infection in the wounds of the patients suffering from smallpox. So this was the first goal Finsen achieved in the late 19th century. And then he was fueled, as I said, by the ideas and findings from Downs and Blunt. And a very big problem these days was that almost all people in Europe, and I guess also um, the US population, in the industrial regions especially, in the cities and towns, people would suffer from diseases of darkness, which are tuberculosis and rickets. And especially the tuberculosis was um, a severe problem which did not only affect children but um, all ages in the population. And the lupus vulgaris, the skin manifestation of um, tuberculosis, was successfully treated by Finsen since he had understood that he could kill the germs in the skin using the short wavelengths he formerly would filter out in the treatment of smallpox. And this was the first systematically described positive phototherapy he was performing. Um, he wrote in, his, um, in one of his books, these two kinds of rays, the red and the violet, also appear to produce very different physiological effects. The violet rays seem to have a more intense action. At least their influence is more evident. And in a way, he should be right in this estimation because it just started in the 1960s then with uh, Endre Mester's experiments using cold laser light sources, the helium neon laser and the um, ruby laser, before science could investigate the effects of the long wavelength part of the spectrum in a specific way. Until up to the 1960s, it was believed that we only are talking about unspecific effects from the red light, but very specific effects from the short wavelength part in the spectrum. And what Finsen um, cites in one of his books, experiments with earthworms which exhibit a negative phototaxis behavior. This means they try to escape from brightness and they search darkness. And when he exchanged the white light with blue light and the darkness with red light, the behavior was exactly the same. So for the earthworm, on a very primitive level of sensory um, awareness, red equals darkness and blue equals bright light and high intensity of light. And I would like to, you to remember this for some of the aspects I'm mentioning later on in my presentation. Here are the three basic principles described by Finsen. Light can penetrate the skin, light can kill bacteria, and light can set the skin into a state of inflammation, which was important because he needed this inflammatory reaction in the skin in order to treat lupus vulgaris. How did this look like? Lupus vulgaris, patient one, it's like a wolf would have bitten right in your face. So this was the skin manifestation of tuberculosis germs. And no other treatment these days could compare to the wonderful results of the Finsen method. Another patient case. So this was a devastating 
disease in these days, and I think up to 30% of the population suffered from tuberculosis these days. And if you would like to make an educated guess how many percent of um, the world population suffers from tuberculosis today, nothing has changed a third of the world population. So what did he do? He brought, he focused light in the, in the area of the margin of these lesions. He focused light onto these lesions and induced an inflammation. And this inflammation reaction resulted in healing. So it was a, um, a long process to bring this into healing. And here you can see the first approaches, Finzen's light elves, the nurses here uh, controlling the handles which compressed the skin. And here you can see a, a lens made from quartz glass which uh, was used to focus the sunlight onto the skin. And here you can see the treatment handles transparent, also made from quartz glass, with a chamber inside for water cooling. Because Finzen did not want to burn the skin, he just wanted to bring the short wavelengths into the skin in order to kill the bacteria, to cause the inflammation, and to, with this incitement um, I already described. So, this was, these were the tools, but one problem he had to face, there were only 30 days in the year where the sun would shine in Copenhagen in Denmark in a quality that he could perform his treatment. And so, in a way, this was a first tiny step into a direction which describes the situation of photobiology in the 20th century. Because he had to switch over to electrical light sources. Because he had thousands of patients seeking for this treatment. So he invented the Finzen method using electrical carbon arc lamps. So he used artificial light and he could use it 24 hours, so 24 7 throughout the year. But now an important question occurred. The search for wavelengths, the search for irradiances, how strong has the light to be shown on the, on the lesions that it works. And finally, the search for the molecules which would accept the radiation. It was the birth, in a way, of action spectra. So what the researchers did, they tried to define which wavelength is absolutely necessary for achieving the effect. This was even more fueled by the discovery of um, Hulczynski in the 1920s. He was a pediatric physician who found out that there must be some substance in the patient suffering from rickets. When he would shine ultraviolet light on one arm, he would see in the x-ray examination several weeks later that the other affected part, the other arm, would also heal up the reossification. And so they mm, supposed there would be some substance, distribute, substance distributed by the blood which circulates in the system and affects all the bones in a positive manner. In a way, the birth of vitamin D. And so they, the, the researchers, the phototechnologists, phototech the, physis the, phys the physicists, they asked the question, what is the process I want to address, the primary photobiological process, 
which are the chromophores involved. So they try to find out the molecule they want to address and they tried to address this with exactly the photons which are tuned energy-wise to this photobiological primary reaction. And in a way, it reduced a lot from where we came from using sunlight with its very specific composition, spectral composition, coming into the modern era of photobiology where they were in search for the perfect tailored, perfectly tailored spectrum. So I would say this is the advantage on one hand, but also the problem of the 21st century photobiology, focusing only on single photobiological aspect. Because we have much more variables in the system. We have, for example, following the primary photobiological reaction, we have subsequent reactions. Reaction chains, they not may follow, they will follow, and they dep depend on individual, for example, uh, genetic uh, preconditions in each different patient. The timing of the treatment, the phase, the circadian phase, for example, all these aspects play a crucial role and I think today we should mm, think in a 21st century manner and here we have to raise the question is it probably better not only to look at a single effect and mechanisms, mechanism but also to look at how to compose the different treatment spectra in a way that the patient benefits. So here are some examples for light matter interactions, kinetic mm, interactions, electronic interactions, ionization, chemical bond breaking, photon-phonon transformation, photoacoustic effects, photoelectric effects, so there was, is a variety, and this is just a fraction of what we know about photobiology today. Um, and I think the red marked uh, aspects in this list, this was what the photobiologists in the 20th century mostly were interested in. So, kind of summary for the first part. I think there is a paradigm shift in the 20th century. Monochromatic versus polychromatic therapeutical spectra. How to combine action spectra with diligence. And I think there is a discussion needed because the light sources are made by physicists. And physicists are thrilled by energy efficiency. So if you look at the light here in your hotel room, here in this conference room, this is the result of the fascination of a physicist. Because we have light, energy efficient light. But the question is, should energy efficiency play a or the crucial role, the paramount role in photobiology? Or should we rather ask for the optimal effects, photobiological effects? I think the latter is the answer I can live much better with. So I would, after this short, short is relative with 24 minutes, introduction, but I have two hours, so. <laughs> just a quarter of the, the full contingent. Three main topics, chronobiology and hormones, retinal hormones, hazards and healing, and consequences for LED spectra, but I wanted to replace this, but then I ran out of time with uh, practical applications. But you will see, see later, the presentation will follow 
uh, kind of different uh, idea in terms of talking about pra practical applications. And I always want to highlight the aspect of complementary spectra, that we don't only look at a certain or narrow bandwidth effect, but keep in mind that we have a much broader spectrum available. Light and chronobiology. Here you can see the night and you can see the day in this yin-yang symbol. Complementary ideas, day and night, brightness and darkness, red and violet. And this change, this constant change and periodicity between day and night, this um, has engraved the 24-hour cycle into our genes, not only into our genes, but into the genes of every living organism on this planet. But I think in, in us, the link between the lighting conditions, our light, lighting environment, and our inner balance, our autonomous reactions and systems, is quite a complex one. And here on this chart, you can see the two master players of this um, back and forth or of this um, bright and darkness cycle. We have the pituitary gland and we have the pineal gland. And these two glands, they rule over all the different inner organs. And it's in fact the um, periodicity between brightness and darkness, which brings our hormones into a wave-like um, behavior. So the stress hormones are suppressed during the night, and the regeneration hormone, it's just one, the melatonin, is suppressed during the day. And when you look, or when we look at the colors daylight, we can see that the sky starts in the red and then there we have, here we only have near infrared and red light. And then more visible parts are added as the sun elevates. So we have, at a certain point, we have the full visible spectrum, we have UVA in addition, and only around noontime, we have the, really the full spectrum, at least in the area in the tropical belt where we have seasons with winter, like in the Baltic region. Even at noontime, there is the UVB lacking completely. So it's not enough there to photosynthesize vitamin D in the skin during winter time between September and March. And when the sun is, starts to set or starts to go down, then we have the opposite composition change. The UVA will be reduced. And when, before the sun is setting, we only have the near infrared and the red. We could, in a way, display it a little bit different. And what we can see here, this is the zero crossing which is marked by the predominance of red in nature. And the peaks of the amplitudes are characterized by blue. We have bright sky blue light during the day, um, during the noon situation. And we have a dark night blue sky during the night. So both amplitudes peak in the short wavelength range. And in a way, we should take this for serious that the red light marks a kind of tipping point to a complete change for our metabolism, for our hormonal system. 
for our endocrine system. So when we look at these two scenes, here in the desert and here in an oasis, where would you rather be if you had the choice? No one would like to be in the desert. So, but when I tell you this uh, resembles the situation which is called um, daylight quality in the lighting technology. Each computer screen is delivered today with the color temperature setting here. 6,500 Kelvin. So you should know how to change this if you don't want to be in this threatening situation, for example, when you are writing, answering your emails after sunset, just as an example. So the colors of our environment, they have a deep impact on our endocrine situation, on the balance in the autonomous situation and this is, as I understand it, also the heart of syntonics, that you are using exactly these natural reactions that our organisms have learned throughout the course of evolution to adapt to the colors in our environment. And the deadly situation, the light hazard already was described by Finzen. It was the short wavelength part of the spectrum. And when you think about the desert situation, this is a threatening situation, which can cause even deadly conditions. Because when you ex experience a severe sunburn, more than 60% of your blood can be shifted into the skin in an extreme case of inflammation. So our body somehow has to react and to detoxify this sunburn. Uh, and the best is be prepared. And how does our body prepare? It evaluates the content of short wavelengths in the light incident to the retina. And the more blue and the brighter the light, the higher the probability that there is a lot of ultraviolet radiation outside. Ultraviolet is invisible, so our body needs some additional uh, information sensor in order to prepare. And how would you prepare for inflammation? How would you prepare for erythema swelling of the capillaries, for example? Here we go. Here we are right in the center of what is needed, the hormones which are controlled by the pituitary gland, the stress hormones, um, adren adrenaline, noradrenaline, ACTH, cortisol, which lowers the inflammatory status. So this is an, a pathway of taking care of too much uh, shortwave radiation in the environment and a way to counteract the threats and the dangers from UV overdosage. The hormonal tides are controlled by light. Here we have the melatonin curve and here we have the stress hormone, pituitary hormone curve. Circadian rhythms are controlled by that here. You can see all the, a number of different body functions which strongly depend on the time of the day or the time during the night. And today we learn better and better that it might not be enough to uh, have just one lighting scheme, one lighting regimen in our caves. It should be something we need for the daytime and there should be some change in the light quality during nighttime. So biphasic natural conditions 
should be uh, resembled by biphasic lighting regimens. <clears throat> but it's not only the change in day and night. We also have outside the tropic uh, region, outside the equatorial region, we also have summer and winter with significant differences, for example, in the length of the day and in the spectral composition. And the highest variation in spectral composi composition um, applies to the ultraviolet B, this portion of the radiation which is able to induce the sunburn, this adverse reaction which, which is so prominent. So the adaptation to seasonal variations also is a matter of light and darkness and it's a matter of brightness and bluish light during the summer and the lack of short wavelengths, vitamin D, during winter. Here we have another graphical summary, melatonin and vitamin D in a way are antagonists which are induced by bluish darkness with low luminance values and um, unsaturated, very intense, bright bluish light on the other hand, indicating that we have high levels of shortwave radiation there. Melatonin is the hormone of darkness. It's a hormone which prepares our system for sleep. It increases the regeneration, reduces the energy production in mitochondria, acts as an antioxidant and scavenger, so acts against free radicals. We will talk about free radicals later on. It antagonizes the aromatase, which is an enzyme uh, responsible for estrogen production in menopausal women, especially. And this, the aromatase um, antagonists are administered to women which suffer from breast cancer, as long as their tissue is estrogen sensitive. So it's crucial, especially for women, to make sure that they have dark, pitch dark condition during the night. And not only during the night, probably it should start even in the, in the in earlier evening hours. Because some research indicates that we have a shortening of the predominance of melatonin of about four hours. It was 100 years ago without artificial electrical light, 10 hours. Uh, in average throughout the year, each day 10 hours of melatonin uh, predominance compared to 5 to 6 hours today. And if we, in, if we consider that it's a hormone of regeneration, then we don't have to ask ourselves if there is an increase in degenerative diseases nowadays. And this not only applies to cancer, for example, here we have another important aspect because melatonin is an antagonistic to cortisol. Cortisol suppresses the immune system. So if you have a predominance of cortisol, the result is that the immune system will not be as effective in, remove, in removing precancerous cells, for example. So another idea another aspect of taking care of your melatonin concentration and avoiding bluish light sources during the night. For example, all of you who um, operate an iOS system, uh, the latest update of iOS integrated the night shift um, property which automatically reduces the content of blue on the screen when the sun has set. So we come to the second part, retinal hormones, hazards and healing. And not only for women suffering from breast cancer, also for every person who owns a pair of eyes, 
regeneration is crucial. Light hygiene to stay away from the short wavelengths during nighttime. This is important because also in the retina we have melatonin control of the regeneration cycles. And the interesting thing is that the melatonin for retinal regeneration does not come from the pineal gland. It is produced on site, in the eyeball. Control everywhere where you have this little green receptor here, you can see in the retinal pigment epithelium, here in the photoreceptor, in the horizontal cells, everywhere in the retina we have this melatonin receptor which is responsible for the regeneration cycles, for the regeneration of the cones and rods. And during the night you need the rods, so normally the cones will be regenerated during the night. And this is controlled by melatonin. So you can easily imagine what happens if you cut down the melatonin concentration by looking into blue light sources after sunset. It shortens the time for retinal regeneration. And have you heard of a retinal degeneration problem which applies to one third of the, of the elder people older than 65? I, I think you heard of this, the age-related macular degeneration, but age-related does not really fit into the actual pattern anymore because there are already patients in the age of 40 suffering from this disease. And 40, in my understanding, not really is aged for a human eye, at least. So why does the retina need regeneration and repair? About 10% of these membrane discs carrying the rhodopsin has to be mm, recycled every 24 hours. 10% will be shedded into the retinal pigment epithelium, which has to digest all this debris and trash. And in fact, it's really stressful for the retina to perform the process of vision. And I, will, I brought an, an experiment which will demonstrate this to you in a way that you might never forget it in the rest of your life. But first I want to show you uh, the overdosage of opposite spectral regions, talking about the discoveries from Herschel and Ritter again. Here we have an infrared overdosage, which is a burn injury. And on the other side, we have an ultraviolet overdosage, which is a light inflammation. This is a sunburn. This is an erythema, light-induced erythema. This is an intoxication with reactive oxygen species, as a kind of foreshadowing. If we look at the overdosing of UV on the skin, we have to discriminate the acute situation from the chronic situation. Here we have the sunburn, an acute overdosage of reactive oxygen species or free radicals. And here we have a case of actinic allostosis, which is the chronic form of overdosage of free radicals. And we can apply this one-to-one -to, -one to the retina. Here on this part of the slide, we have the acute form. This is the blue light hazard. The blue light hazard is defined to look at maximally 10,000 seconds. So this really is an acute occurrence or event. And I wrote here LSD, three letters. This was a soldier on on a trip, on an LSD trip, staring into the sunlight and receiving this photochemical uh, damage. This is a blue light hazard, an acute event. 
On the other <laughs> hand, we have a chronic event which is not well regarded by the ophthalmologists at the moment because they only know how to look at the acute stuff. They have no even not a name for the chronic overdosage of short wavelength light. And here, provocatively, I also took three letters, LED, because many of the LED light sources have the spectral properties to induce chronic long-term damage of your retinal structures, probably in many cases leading to age-related macular degeneration. And I think it's clever or it's a good idea. I don't think if I'm, don't know if I'm clever, but I think at least it's a good idea to call this the blue light impairment just to discriminate between the acute, clearly defined situation and the not so well defined chronic situation, which is much more difficult to investigate, by the way. So we were talking about this, the age-related macular degeneration. Here, a simulation on the right side. Here, in optical coherence tomography uh, chart, which shows us we are talking about a very delicate structure right in the middle of the eye, the, the area of sharpest vision. And now... I think you are ready for this little experiment. Uh, I want you to experience the properties of the spectrum, both ends of the spectrum. Here I have two light sources. Uh, no. <laughs> I have to walk through the arena here. Here we have the red, and here we have the violet. And what do you think? Which one is the warm, the thermal radiation, and which one is the cold radiation? Warm, cold. Okay. I would like to ask you not to directly look into the light and to position it over your lip because this is the area with the highest temperature sensitivity. Here we have the warm light and here we have the cold light. <laughs> And when you hold the violet light a little bit longer in, onto your lip, you will probably even experience that this is not just warmth, not a comfortable warm uh, influence, but that it has a kind of aggressiveness. It has a sharpness. And this sharpness comes from the instant generation of reactive oxygen species. And these free radicals, or reactive oxygen species, they are helpful in a certain concentration range. They are door keepers, responsible for the first line defense. They destroy bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Practically all dermal light reactions depend on the generation of reactive oxygen species. So they are signaling molecules responsible for photoadaptation, for the production of the horny layer of the skin, for the production of mm, melanin. Do not confuse this with melatonin. Melanin, the black pigment, is also dependent from reactive oxygen species 
induction in the skin. So free radicals are helpful and necessary and they help us to survive as long as they are within a certain range. When they exceed the healthy concentration, they become nasty. They are harmful and dangerous. If the concentration gets too high, they turn into radical hooligans. Any idea what class of molecules helps against free radicals? Antioxidants. Right. So, it's all about the optimal blend. We need reactive oxygen species, but we have to control them. And can you really be sure that if you ingest antioxidants, that they will end up in the cells which are stressed and need them most? Probably not, because we have no idea about the amount which is beneficial, but we definitely know from some papers from the last one or two years that too much of, free, of, of antioxidants can even increase the spreading of melanoma cells. We know from sports that if uh, an athlete ingests too much antioxidants, the training effect will disappear because he also scavenges the, signal, the signaling aspects of the free radicals. But there is, uh, mm, thankfully, there is a mechanism, or there are several mechanisms, which enable ourselves, our cells to produce their own antioxidants. And this is also a reaction triggered by light. So, on the short wavelength part of the spectrum, we have the desired effect, if the dose is correct, and we have stress, we have cellular stress, if the dose levels, if the dose thresholds are exceeded. And on the other side, we have cellular regeneration and repair. The red light is able to increase the adenosine triphosphate or ATP production in cells and the red light is also able to increase the production of antioxidants via a biphasic mechanism which is a little bit complicated but you can tell this from the next slide. Here we have a chart uh, depicting the reactive oxygen species production depending on wavelength. UVB, UVA, even stronger peak. And here, in this area, in the visible part of the spectrum, from violet to green, we still have significant um, reactive oxygen species production. And then, in the region of green, there is almost nothing. <coughs> Vitamin D. By the way, uh, would someone be willing to give me some water? Um, what is interesting is that here, in the long wavelength part of the spectrum, there are two additional little peaks. So I told you, thank you very much. I told you that red light uh, increases regeneration and even induces the production of antioxidants, but not in the first step. In the first step, there is a tiny increase of free radicals also induced by red light. Where could this come from? Red light has not enough quantum energy to directly produce free radicals. But red light, this we know for example from Tina Caro's work, red light is able to influence the mitochondrial 
uh, activity and therefore to increase the ATP production. And what, might, what do mitochondria metabolize? Sugar or carbohydrates, right? And what do they urgently need to produce the energy? Oxygen. For a mitochondria, there is a kind of rule that 5 to 10% of the oxygen metabolized for energy for ATP production ends up as free radicals. So if we shine red light on the cells, on the mitochondria, the increase of energy production leads to an increase in the first step of free radicals as well. But the cell is intelligent. If this is a clear connection, a clear link, the more energy production, the more free radicals in the area of mitochondria, what would you think, what will the intelligent cell finally do? Take care of this problem, knowing that where something is burned, something has to be detoxified. So the mechanism is called mitochondrial signaling. The species generated by elevation of mitochondrial activity, um, the species of free radicals, is detected by the nucleus and taken as a signal for producing more um, antioxidants in order to detoxify this. And when you now think back to the change in spectral distribution during the day, we could even claim that the red light and the lack of short wavelengths in the morning sun are a kind of preconditioning enabling our cells via this mitochondrial signaling to prepare for the UV peak in the middle of the day which is quite clever, I think. And there are indicators or uh, research um, results. They indicate that this process, uh, in fact, really happens. Coming back to the reactive oxygen species and what they do in our eye. We were talking about the blue light hazard. We have to discriminate between the class 1 blue light hazard, which is rhodopsin-mediated, and the class 2 blue light hazard, which is lipofuscin-mediated. Lipofuscin mainly is found in the retinal pigment epithelium, and rhodopsin is found in the photoreceptors, in the Müller cells, and in the retinal pigment epithelium. So, here is the area where the class 1 blue light hazard occurs and the area where the blue light hazard class 2 occurs mainly. So two types of blue light hazard, two types of reaction chains. And it's quite easy when you look at the class 2, which is lipofuscin mediated. So we have a clear dependence on wavelengths. This is the reactive oxygen species production depending on wavelength. We would have to make an overlay with the transmission curve of the eye media, of the optical media of the eye, in order to find out which are the most dangerous um, wavelengths in the visible part of the spectrum. But here, it's much more complicated. The rhodopsin itself, it's not only the pigment, which is the precondition for our vision. It's also a photosensitizer. After the rhodopsin has digested the photon, it comes into an excited state where it's um, able to absorb 550 nanometers. But this might not be the problem because um, the time um, the lifetime of this intermediate uh, product is only 200 femtoseconds. 
Then it transforms into the Bateau intermediate, which absorbs at 535 nanometer. Um, and it's just 150 nanoseconds until it transforms into the next intermediate and so on. So the wavelength dependency of the reactive oxygen species production, which is mediated via rhodopsin, is much, much more complicated. Maybe you can understand that it's here we have different absorption spectra for the different intermediates. And what does it mean if, let's say, the meta-3, which has a lifetime between 300 seconds and one hour, if this is able to absorb a photon with 465 nanometers, what happens if this intermediate absorbs a photon? It generates a free radical. So rhodopsin itself is a photosynthesizer, a photosensitizer for the reactive oxygen species production. And we can already see from this chart or from this graph, we can learn about the wavelengths of a light source, which might be problematic if we are thinking about avoiding age-related macular degeneration you try to avoid photosensitization via rhodopsin. Uh, is this somehow clear? It's one, it's one photosensitizer, and it is the photosensitizer for the class one blue light hazard. So now we talk about a little bit more about the tissue regeneration and repair, which occurs on the long wavelength part of the spectrum. We could talk about um, three, at least three different aspects, the chronobiology, aspect is we learned from Finsen and the earthworm that red light equals darkness. So red light eliminates the visual stress which is caused by short wavelength. We have to talk about water activation and the energy production and this colorful molecule which is the cytochrome C oxidase which is involved in the energy production in the frame of the electron transport chain. And I want to talk about another molecule. This is nitric oxide, NO, which is also a reactive oxygen species molecule. It's a molecule of the year 1992. It has several aspects. One of the properties led to the development of Viagra, for example. It is a signaling molecule, and it's a major regulator of microcirculation. It induces a photovasorelaxation. So in the capillary layers of tissue, nitric oxygen will lead to a massively increased blood circulation. But on the other hand, nitric oxygen blocks the cytochrome C oxidase, the reaction center in the right in the middle of this molecule, <clears throat> which normally is occupied by oxygen. So short wavelength light liberates nitric oxygen via specific mechanisms, via specific enzymes, for example, Nitric oxide enhances the, re the blood circulation on one hand, but suppresses the energy production on the other hand. And here, the blue light is able to produce nitric oxygen, and the red light is able to liberate the blocking molecule from the reaction center in the cytochrome C oxidase. Here we have low ATP production because the nitric oxygen 
blocks the last step in the electron transport chain, leading to the low production of ATP. And once we shine red light and near-infrared light onto this scene, nitric oxygen is removed from the reaction center and the cell, the mitochondrium, is able to start with the ATP production. So, can you understand why I show you this mechanism? It's all about complementary spectra. If we are using only short wavelengths, without the longer wavelengths, we have to calculate in that there might be a massive change in the reaction pattern of the cell. And unfortunately, it's almost every time the same. It's much more complicated than we previously thought. So light, which is blue enhanced with a lack of long wavelengths in the red and the near infrared, is not only one problem. It is not only more stressful, but it also is less regenerative. So the scissors fall apart. Water activation. We talked a little bit about the energy production. Talking about water activation. Water is able especially to absorb light in the longer part of wavelength part of the spectrum, starting with orange or red and peaking somewhere in the infrared B. And the positive thing is that red light and near infrared light is able to penetrate deeply into the tissue. Without heating the tissue, you already felt on your lip, but activating the water molecule motion movement in a very specific way. I call this light-enhanced diffusion. Here we have the capillary, layer, uh, capillary vessel. Here we have the photoreceptor. And here we have the extracellular matrix, which is mainly based on water, 90% or even more water molecules, between the nourishing vessels and the photoreceptors, which are quite hungry. They need a lot of energy for repair, for functioning properly. So, without near-infrared and red light, we have lazy water molecules and the transportation velocity, velocity goes down. When we use the long wavelength part of the spectrum, the red light and the near-infrared light, you can see that there is an activation in the extracellular matrix which enhances the diffusion process. And when you now think back what you know about the anatomy of the macula in your eye, there is no part in your body where the distance between the nourishing vessels and the energy-hungry receptor cells, or cells uh, in general, is larger than in the macula in the human retina. You know there are no blood vessels there. So my interpretation of these facts is that the human eye could only be developed by evolution because all the natural light sources contained red light and near-infrared light. Sunlight, for example, contains as much energy in the near-infrared as it contains energy in the visible part of the spectrum. A bit, bit more than 40% visible and a bit more than 40% in the near-infrared. So all natural light sources help the eye uh, by transportation and enhancing the diffusion processes in this critical region of the macula. 
And this could be a problem with our general lighting appliances we are using today. The incandescent lamp has been phased out or banned and all the light sources we have at hand nowadays, fluorescent lights, LED lights, contain not even red. The longest wavelength is orange red, but no near infrared. So these mechanisms might break, they might fail. When we look at the evolution of light, then the longest time, 4.6 billion years ago since the sun first time went up, um, all these light sources, including the incandescent lamp, which was invented in 1879 by Edison, were thermal light sources. And since the 1930, 1930s, there was the advent of the non-thermal light sources. And in the meantime, um, when we forget the candle, but the incandescent lamp already has been banned and is, has disappeared from almost all the spaces where humans live, which might increase in future days the incidence for macular degeneration significantly, but we will know in 10 or 20 years, right? So here I show you some artificial light source spectra. The incandescent lamp, this is an LED. Here we have a fluorescent lamp and an OLED. And I brought an LED with me, which demonstrates the principle white light is produced via a fluorescent area a fluorescent layer here and the primary light source is blue and you might not want to look into it because it's really aggressive and it will heat up your lip immediately and when it's too dangerous <laughs> if you have <clears throat> LEDs around and I and I pass this uh, on again or again, this is the chocolate effect, and you realize that the aggressive effect is filtered out completely. So what can we do? Today there are already different types of, of LEDs and even I, here I can show you two LEDs with the same color temperature, about 3000 Kelvin. One has a color rendering index of 95, the other has a color rendering index of 83, which is really bad in my opinion, and they mm, almost look identical. But when we arrange the spectra in a different manner, we can see the peak of the one is around 410 and the peak of the other is around 450, which is the same you would find in standard LEDs. On the other hand, the one with the longer wavelength in the blue has a shorter wavelength peak in the orange red and very little uh, intensity here in the near infrared, almost nothing. And the, the upper one peaks a little bit more in the longer part of the longer wavelength part of the spectrum, covering about um, 300, uh, 660, 670 nanometers. So here we have two absorption peaks of the cytochrome C oxidase, which are well served by this spectrum, which is a little bit broader and therefore much, much healthier to the eye. And um, I don't want to bother you with these 
numbers, but there are ICNIRP guidelines with um, a weighting function uh, which tells you which part in the spectrum is the most dangerous one. And the 435 nanometers have a factor of 1. 410 only have a factor of 0.4. And 460 have um, a weighting function of 0.8, which is double the number of the 410. So normally you would think the shorter wavelength is more dangerous to the retina, but this is not true. The wavelength which is actually used as the driver spectrum for LEDs is here in this area between 450 and 460, and this is almost as dangerous as the most aggressive wavelength. This depends on the transparency of the lens, of course, and of the optical media, that it's not linearly the shorter the wavelength, the more uh, dangerous it is. So this is just to give you an idea that it's worthwhile thinking about the detailed spectral composition as long as we cannot use incandescent light or thermally active light. So the conclusion for LED spectra, shorter wavelength is less stress, but not completely. We have to look at the weighting function, and longer wavelengths mean better repair. So if we can lower the, pe the peak in the blue, this definitely causes much less stress. So a bonus topic, color rendering. The contemporary recommendations for the color rendering index, um, 80 to 86 for illumination in schools, offices, industrial buildings, hospital rooms, um, 86 to 92, illumination in showrooms, car salons, hotels, which is not reached, by the way, in this particular one. In this particular one, we have the AR80, so a very bad color rendering. And the best color rendering is um, asked for the illumination in museums, in film and TV production, for the presentation of luxury goods, exclusive fashion product shows, jewelry, etc. And when you try to find out if a light source, if a lamp you are purchasing in the store has a good color rendering, then you only get the RA index, which comprises eight different colors, which had been chosen in former times because they are very friendly to fluorescent lamps. So a fluorescent lamp gives you better values as long as you are looking at these uh, mm, lavender and, and non-saturated colors. When you are looking at or taking into account the mm, saturated colors, red, yellow, green, leaf green, strong blue, or here, it's light yellowish, yellowish pink. This is the skin color, in fact. So for the skin color, an LED is not mm, potent to give a good rendering of the skin color, which means where you have social interaction, you will face problems with these bad values. Um, it's always better to look at the full set of test colors in order to find out if it is a good light quality or not. Another bonus topic is the flicker. Many of the LEDs have the tendency to flicker intensely. And this is in a lecture hall in Berlin. And I was just moving the camera when I took the photograph. And you can see this, the phantom array effect, which means this shows you the, the flicker of the light in the camera in a dimmed fluorescent lamp. And again, I have a little demonstration here. What do you think? Do we have flickering light here in this room? Yes or no? Oh, yeah. And it's 
do not want some because um, well, maybe it's, it's quite kind of okay. But here I have the LED and how LEDs normally are used. It's that way. They are fast here to switch on and off. So how can you find out if this is the case? Look between with your eyes and your head being kept still between my two pieces. Can you reproduce the electronic arrangement? Yes? I can move the lamp as well, so you can see even if you, you're not willing to have this pleasant experience. <laughs> but I can show you or demonstrate to you how this sounds to the reader. And this is the way LEDs normally are dimmed, especially when you have color changing systems, which have this beautiful color shift throughout the rainbow. These are normally flicker machines. And here we have two charts, a little bit too small for you to read, but um, I will put the presentation uh, to my Dropbox so all of you can download it uh, at, I think, latest when I'm home because the internet connection is pretty slow here in this hotel, so it might not work. Uh, the reference is also quoted mm, here. And some of these aspects are not accepted, widely accepted, but for that purpose I have this slide, um, Certainty in Science. May I introduce myself? I'm the st statistical probability, and this guy means pleased to meet you. I'm the residual risk. Cosmetic appliances. We can learn a lot from what happens to the retina uh, for the skin, which is also exposed to artificial light sources. And no one really talks about today, for example, about the, the skin cancer and the dependency from uh, artificial light. There had been a time some decades ago where they found out that you have more um, melanoma in indoor workers uh, exposed to fluorescent lamp light compared to outdoor workers. But then the lighting industry claimed this cannot be because we produce no ultraviolet radiation with our fluorescent lamps. But when you uh, think back about the potential of short wavelength light in the violet, in the indigo, and in the blue, it can definitely penetrate even deeper compared to ultraviolet radiation. And in fluorescent light, we have a very sharp peak in the area where you find the highest potential to produce um, reactive oxygen species. And again, the lack of near-infrared and longer wavelengths in the red. So again, this shift, um, more highlighting of the damaging part and a reduction of the regeneration part in the spectrum. Um, looking at the spectral ranges for cosmetic applications, here we have a number of different light sources. And in the right half of this um, slide, it's almost a purely thermal effect. I don't want to talk about the purely thermal effects today, so we enlarge this a little bit, zoom in, and here there is, uh, for example, sunlight with the uh, full spectrum, the incandescent lamp, which is uh, quite weak in the UV region, but quite strong in the near-infrared region, incandescent water-filtered infrared flashlight, thermal red light, helium neon laser, just this very small part of the wave band, red light LED, 
and energizing light. This is a technology I was involved in. Um, and I'm sure you heard about photobiomodulation before. And this is a, a unit which produces this energizing light between 570 nanometers and 850 nanometers for full body photobiomodulation. So you can take a light bath without any ultraviolet light and still it is quite an experience to be immersed in this near infrared and red light. And what can we achieve using this particular part of the spectrum? Um, beneficial tissue effects of photobiomodulation can be demonstrated on mood, on hair, nerves, blood, skin, connective tissue, joints, muscles, bones. So all the cells harboring mitochondria can benefit. And we already learned that the passage in the extracellular matrix also can be enhanced. And what did we do with the energizing light? We tailored a spectrum which addresses the four absorption peaks of the cytochrome C oxidase in the long wave range here in the orange, in the deep red, and in two um, parts of the near-infrared spectrum, which had been demonstrated by Tina Caro as beneficial. And I also made a study. I performed a clinical study with uh, 128 uh, subjects. And we were looking for skin rejuvenation for the decrease of uh, fine lines and wrinkles and the increase of collagen in the dermal layers of the skin. And uh, in order to um, examine our subjects non-invasively, we performed a ultrasonic evaluation of the change in collagen density in the skin, in the dermis. And collagen is a marker for fibroblast activity. Fibroblasts are the most important, the, the, the housekeepers or the, mm, yeah, the, they are responsible, the handymans of the tissue. They are responsible for uh, skin remodeling, tissue remodeling, and they are the only group of cells which are able to produce collagen, which makes up to 30% of all the proteins in our body. And here you can see the ultrasonic assessment uh, on the left side before, a 30, um, 30 times treatment. This is the epidermis, this yellow uh, layer, and directly under the epidermis, <coughs> In the, in the capillary dermis, which is uh, depicted over here, we see the so-called age band. And after 30 applications in this subject, the age band has refilled. And what you can see, the green, greenish, yellowish, and red structures, these are the collagen fibers, which are assessed via the ultrasonic um, detection. So. This was baseline, left and right, before the treatment of 15 applications. Here you can clearly see the H-band. Here you can see the refill of the H-band significantly. And taking photographs, you can have changes like that. And we did not use any cosmetics. It was purely the effect of the energizing light used on these subjects. And another practical application is hybrid tanning. I'm a consultant for the world market leader in uh, tanning machines. And tanning machines are not really regarded as good appliances at the moment. Um, but on the other hand, we still have no solution for the problem in our Western societies that we live more or less in biological darkness. And addressing only the eyes might not be enough because we were made mm, in a way that our skin expects to get a certain 
amount of sunlight. And what is the problem if you have to go to work, if you are in an industrial region, you cannot access sunlight when, it's, when it has its highest beneficial content of radiation, which is in the middle of the day for, let's say, 10 to 20 minutes, at least if you want to keep your vitamin D level in a, a region where it's regarded as beneficial. So people have no access in many regions in the industrialized world to sunlight when it's, when it's there because they have to go to work or when it's weekend they have no chance to adapt, slowly adapt to the sunlight. If they travel, uh, if they have a vacation, let's say when I travel to Hawaii then I have a 12 hours time shift which is a problem because my cells, not only my brain, but also my skin cells, are jet lagged. So when the sun is shining in Hawaii, my skin cells are sleeping because it's midnight. So we face a lot of problems when we do not really have access to natural sunlight. So this is unsolved, the problem. And I work um, with hybrid tanning um, which means we are combining beneficial parts of the spectrum. Here we have just the UV uh, for the cosmetic purposes. And when we combine longer wavelengths, for example, this energizing light or the collagen lamp light, which also is um, quite active in the um, energizing region with the UV, we can have much better results by lowering the cumulative dose of UV and um, tanners who are experienced, they definitely can tell the difference that it's much less stressful if you have this combination of short wavelengths with long wavelengths. Or in other words, if you only have a hammer, each problem looks like a nail. So um, the skin color signals health. And it's not only that we have an increase in melanin, it's also the increase in blood circulation in the capillary layer. And the combination of the red value and the gray value makes the skin look healthy. And this is quite important. When does the skin look healthy? The importance of color rendering. So we partly come back to what we already learned about fluorescent lamps and LED lamps, they have a miserable color rendering compared to an incandescent lamp, which has a color rendering index of almost 100, exactly the same value than the sun has. Or a candle also has 100. So the skin looks best in thermal light sources. When you look at each other, when you're standing in the elevator here in this hotel, you probably we learn a little bit better what I'm talking about. And if you stand in front of your mirror in the morning in the bathroom, in the light of an LED or a fluorescent lamp, I don't think that you feel so good because I don't think that you look healthy. And your laugh tells me, laughing tells me that you know what I'm talking about. So the importance of color rendering. The Earth. It's the most colorful planet. And color means information. Color gives us a lot of information. What is shown here can only be detected when I add the color to the slide. The same to this bird. Now you can see he's not alone. He has a lot of eyes, a lot of uh, guys behind him. They would help him if you will start to hassle with him. So again, some enhancement, some, some uh, increased information. So uh, when we ask ourselves what and when color started to become such an important information in our past, then um, when you have seen Ice Age, the little mammal with the big eyes living during the night and the non-primate monkeys living only during the night. They need light collectors, but they are unable to detect colors. 
they have to see during the night in order to protect themselves from becoming prey. Um, so smell olfactory signals had been very important when you think, for example, a group of dogs, they communicate via olfactory signals, not via colors. And the problem with the pheromones is that they are not the best choice in groups which, are, which cover more than 30 subjects. And you can see it here in this animation. If olfactory signals are used for social communication, it is not to alloc difficult to allocate who is the individual causing the problems. And 23.5 million years ago, you can demonstrate in the genes of our ancestors, the old world monkeys, that there was a decrease in the genes regarding the pheromone signaling, but suddenly they became able to see colors as we do. So olfactory signals had been replaced by visual signals. And this was important for, for the primates in order to survive. Uh, the monkeys have no, no weapons, no long teeth and whatever, no paw. Uh, so our um, way to protect ourselves and our uh, kids is to form large groups. We have up to five, six hundred individuals in a group uh, in some monkeys. So pheromones won't do the job. Color is the social communication means uh, number one for larger groups. And here you can see why. The boss wants to know who is causing the problems. Now you know exactly who is the guy. And whoever experienced what happens when you forgot to switch off your smartphone in a group and it suddenly rings, then you might be able to detect a sudden reddening of the ears of your face, depending on how cool you are. But um, it is a special performance of the human skin to immediately change the color um, in terms of changing the blood circulation. And another parameter is very important. This is the oxygen saturation of the blood. Um, blood, deoxygenized blood is more purple and oxygenized blood is more scarlet in color. And the skin color, oxygen saturation and blood circulation shifts if you have a lot of blood um, and it's deoxygenized, you have a kind of turquoise. So this is the matrix of the rainbow colors depending on less blood or more blood, deoxygenized and oxygenized blood. So to be, to be able to produce the rainbow colors on our skin correlates with the ability to detect the colors with our retinal structures, with the cones in our retina. And this is called the color phase hypothesis. And um, they can, researchers can demonstrate that those with the light collection eyes, uh, with only monochromatic equipment in the retina, unable to see different colors, they only have 20% of bare skin in the face compared to the routine trichromats where we are one in the group, they have up to 80 to 90% bare skin in the face in order to enable this interspecies communication via color, via skin color. Which means also is this a healthy mating uh, proposal standing uh, opposite to me? So you know if someone suffers from liver disorder, this can be easily detected. And you can mm, detect probably if someone will faint in the next seconds just by looking at the color. And I can show you later a little uh, program in my iPhone, which is able to tell you your heart rate just from amplifying the mm, color modulations of your face. 
uh, it's best to do it in daylight, but this is also possible, and it tells us that I, our eyes probably also are able to detect fine shifts in this uh, regard. Again, skin color signals health. And um, coming back to the hybrid tanning, with UV we only address the melanin production and we want to influence also the dermal layers of the skin. We have to use other um, parts of the spectrum and I compare this. I like to compare this with um, the short wavelengths represented by the blue light, blue LED light. When you look at the penetration depth of the blue, it's only superficial. And when you look at the penetra penetration depth of the red, you'll see a significant difference. So addressing all the different layers requires several um, spectra in order to combine it for the optimal um, effect. Again, this plays a role. We already looked into this chart, combining the stressful part of the spectrum with the regenerative part, regenerative part of the spectrum also is a, um, the use of complementary spectra also is beneficial for tanning. And maybe in the future it's more than just tanning. Maybe when we can even come closer to the qualities of sunlight. Um, here are some quotes from the literature. Red light protects cells, for example, dermal fibroblasts. Red light enhances cellular resistance to UV. If you, I talked about the preconditioning of the skin. Here you see um, a light stare, which means determining the MED, the minimal erythema dose. On the left side, the skin seems to be much more tolerant to the same UV dose compared to the right side. And the reason is that the left side had been pre-irradiated with LED light in the range of 620 to 630 nanometers. And this made the skin more resistant um, to the ultraviolet radiation. And this is one paper addressing the secondary uh, increase of antioxidant uh, substances following uh, 635 nanometer LED irradiation. So here the research focus will be the balanced spectral distribution for optimal effects, but for artificial light sources for general uh, lighting, this should also be an issue. Some negative chromotherapy um, aspects when we look at a computer monitor this is an active light source and some people look eight hours stare eight hours and even longer into a computer monitor and you already made the experience the violet light and even blue light heats up your tissue and you can feel the stress and when you intersect this yellow filter then the stress is completely eliminated, which was induced by short wavelength light. Here you can see um, a spectral distribution from a TFT monitor, LED-based, and you can imagine that this peak has quite um, aggressive potential. And the blue light, to summarize, has neg negative effects onto the eye, retinal damage, eye fatigue, eye discomfort, and effects on the entire body in terms of circadian rhythm, disruption, sleep deprivation, obesity, cancer, and even mental health. When we look at the optical properties, what is the problem with the blue light? We have a high blur because uh, due to the refraction index of the optical media, when red and green are focused into the macula, the blue will focus a little bit in front of that, which makes it difficult to see blue sharply, what you can prove yourself when you look at some blue lighting appliances, uh, for example, for um, 
during the night, then it's very difficult to focus the blue. Blue light hampers vision and increases blur, and if we filter out the blue with blue light protection glasses, for example, then we can increase vision and contrast. These are glasses um, which do a perfect job. You can see when you recall the spectrum from uh, four slides before, the blue is almost fully eliminated by using this computer and endocrine system protection glasses. But, but we know, for example, for children, it's not enough if they play around with their, with their gadgets to give them blue light protection because this might help to increase myopia. Um, we need at least one hour of blue light enhanced environment, but not in a room, in a cave, but outside, in order to give an impulse to the eyeball not to lengthen in order to increase myopia. And this even is reflected when you look at the serum vitamin D levels. So the axial length of the eyeball and the low serum vitamin D is associated in young children. Practical applications, positive chromotherapy. Another practical application, I want to give you a short insight and kind of reminder. I'm working with the spectrochrome system since many, many years, and it uh, has common roots with the syntonics, because uh, uh, Harry Riley Spittler in the 1930s uh, must have known Dinsha Gadiali, and there are so many similarities in the color set between the syntonics and the spectrochrome method, with one difference. Spectrochrome had been banned because it treated, it was quackery, it treated the skin, it treated the full body, and spectrochrome only, uh, syntonics only focused on, on the eyes, and this was mm, a, a clever decision uh, not to claim for more than the visual aspects using the colors in these days but I will show you some quackery. This is a skin burn, second and third degree, with the scar strictures under nowadays treatment. And here I can show you a skin burn treatment using the spectrochrome colors in a patient of mine. It dates back to 1997. 11th of October, I saw the patient for the, very, for the first time. I had to remove the blister um, surgically, so you can see it the second day, the third day, the fourth day, and you can see up to the third day it had been treated with indigo and indigo and turquoise, indigo and turquoise, only turquoise, day five and six, turquoise day seven and eight, and from these pictures you can tell it was probably a 2.5 degree skin burn from boiling water. Um, it was not treated by a wound dressing. It was only treated by irradiation with the colors quoted on the slides. And it's day 20, it's, it was the 21st, so 10 days after the event, 14 days after the event. This is the last residual, so you could say it healed up completely, turquoise and orange in the following days, and here the comparison day one and six years later, no scarring, no residues, so it was uh, a direct healing just using spectrochrome, so for me, I experienced it my, myself, it's a very potent um, method, it consists of 12 different colors, here we have nine spectral colors, and when you resample or you think about the climate control, then you have four different steps. Lemon is the um, color with the lowest heating potential. Green is neutral. Red has the highest heating potential. And 
The same in opposite turquoise is the weakest cooling color and indigo uh, or violet is the strongest cooling color. So you have um, four different intensities for heating and cooling. This resembles that in inflammation, for example, in acute inflammation, we have a heating of the tissue, which can be cooled down using the ultra green colors, the cooling colors, and the chronic mm, diseases, the chronic inflammation is characterized by a decrease of temperature. And in this case, we would use the warming colors. So the chronic problems are problems which had been put on ice by the organism. And if you have a frozen steak and you want to mm, heat it up, you want to put it in the frying pan, what will happen if the steak was frozen? It will burn outside. You have to warm it up slowly. So for chronic disorders, lemon as the weakest warming color is the first and best choice. The spectrochrome colors, they are highly saturated. So the U is not only, it's not only enough to say red is stimulating, the saturated red is tonifying, but the Mm, red with a low saturation is sedative and for the blue the same is true. The night blue is sedative and the sky blue uh, color during the middle of the day is tonifying. So one and the same color depending on the saturation can have opposite effects. So Dinsha's spectrochrome is very specific in terms of opposite and complementary colors. When we look again at this color system, we see here the opposite colors with exactly opposite physiological activity. Red is an opposite color of blue. Orange is an opposite color of indigo. Yellow is an opposite color of violet. And then we have a symmetry break. Lemon is an opposite color of turquoise. And scarlet is an opposite color of purple. And the complementary colors in physics are composed quite different because green and magenta together would give you white light. So the complementary colors and the opposite colors are something different. Again, with the colors scarlet, magenta, and purple, we are talking about antagonistic colors where we have the antagonistic kind of complementary parts of the spectrum, the red and the violet applied at the same time. And here I used, I decided to use two pendulums. Uh, for example, if you have an overactivity, if the pendulum is overactive, then green could be used to calm down the activity. Um, if the pend pendulum stands still, you might want to use red and violet alternate in an alternating manner in order to enhance the rhythmicity and in order to give a signal to bring back the oscillation. And you could use magenta, scarlet and purple. Whoever tried to adjust a clock with a pendulum, if the pendulum goes duck, 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 everything is fine. If the clock is not adjusted perfectly well, the pendulum goes duck, 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 duck. And this is the moment short, shortly before the clock will end up standing still because the tick more it doesn't make duck duck, duck duck, it makes duck. So when you have this pendulum in mind and you know how the colors work, you can add this to your therapeutical consideration. If you want to try the spectrochrome glasses, which are available since a few months, I brought some of them with me. You can also try the glasses and I think my 
clock tells me I'm talking since one hour and 45 minutes. So I'm perfectly in time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Young lady in the back. So we were talking about the building and that sort of thing, and so there are the frequency of the device is probably the worst. So um, we've had a huge increase in um, depression in our teens and suicide in our teens, and they're always right here on those little tiny devices and they're sitting in classrooms without even windows. They've taken away recess so they can work right in the classroom. So I'm, you know, I know that part of it is diet, but our diet has been crappy for decades. So how much of, um, so this has touched my family very closely this year, which is why it's sitting back here kind of tearing up. But when, when you, could, could the weight thing be a big weight? standards and all these uh, responsible uh, guys, they at the moment do not listen, or at least it seems, or it sounds to me, that they do not listen, that they have reasons for that. Because who takes over the responsibility? If they would admit they make big mistakes, who can? So, Very important. And still, you can purchase, for example, some <coughs> Indian national land to do it. And don't believe those who make their money selling to the Americans. I have problems, for example, in China's country, China's country, in Germany. And they ask me to consult them because they are clever business guys uh, traveling through the country. Having also already the template, so they get the, the money from, from the state, the, the product, the IP license. And if you are familiar with China, warmth and temperature was so important to him, and still the argument do not hold because they see the dollar on their side. And I, I went to discussions which are 
good to us because in the end, the decision is made for the money and not for the city. I was raising the question that we call it biology energy efficiency should be efficient or not. So, this in a way explains also the situation I am in. And even my son, who is 27, that for me all the time people say that this would be so dangerous and we shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> already have been forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> this is the naive approach, right? And my idea was to give you some ideas if there is a way out today. So if, if you so my question is So he's taken our entire house in the spectral of the e And my son said the other day, Dad, what did you do in the, in the kitchen to fly to the beach? So he notices the difference in the vibration. But so what can you, are there still lights on the market that you can use that aren't going to decrease the sun? So I have, I have the two of these clear detectors. I bought two of them. Are 100 euro and they are for you in good condition to check if you go out and buy an LED lamp, you go out and measure them. You measure your computer screen, measure everything you can what you take into your house in order to avoid to buy a toy. Just multiply this with the hours in the TV, and then you have an idea of the potential stress. Learn how to reduce the fuel in the, the kids tent with the night shift or with the Etna. And probably, if you are already um, talking, use the blue light protection glasses. And so, we, there are tools and there are strategies. To use the risk and make yourself clear there is no artificial full spectrum source around besides the infrared sun lamp. So go out into the nature and give yourself at least those one hour a day of natural light because our people can stand a lot, really a lot, as long as we keep the oscillation, as long as we keep the pendulum. So I don't think that this that this take home message of my presentation should be seen to be depressed or frustrated. I think the home I wish that the home message the opposite. You can do a lot, and if you are unable to take interest in certain situations, think about other situations. For the influence. Emancipate yourself from the light traction. Yeah, because the employer probably wants you to be more productive instead of giving you a, a better task, a non boring task. He gives you light version. So you don't have to. Take yellow glasses, put them on, and you put yourself up. Uh, we need to get going here. We're, we're over time, so I'm sure there's a lot of good questions, but uh, Alexander, if you can take them after. Afterward. I will be here yeah. until Sunday, and um, I have, for example, a message for Larry, the Lucia text. I, can, I could make some evaluations here. I brought the Lucia test, the color test with me. So if you are interested to, to make one, it is normally when you do it with subscription, about 100 euro, about 20. Then I can send you a detailed um, evaluation from, derived from your color choice, derived from the 
color preferences. And so just keep contact. I'm here and uh, I will recover uh, from all the stuff where, where I'm at home again uh, Monday or Tuesday next week. So it should not be just the two hours of this presentation because it took a long time and many miles for me to, to come over. So yeah, this is what I can offer. Great. Okay, we got uh, 20 minutes. Uh, we'll see you back here at 11.30. Well done. Well done. That was great. I put all new lights in my house. I got one comment on your, your blue light. There's a difference between distance and close. When you're focusing up close, you require less accommodation with blue light. So it's actually, from an accommodative point of view, more comfortable. It also puts more blue light onto the macula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, because it focuses that. Right, because it's easier to focus on. But if you give them all F dot lux computer screen, you're increasing the accommodative stress mm -hmm. on the patient. So, can't win. So, you can't win.